Only a few open spaces had been paved over for parking use. Adjacent to the northern boundary of the district is Mount Holly Cemetery, which was added to the National Register on March 5, 1970. Northeast of the district is the MacArthur Park Historic District, and to the south, west, and east lie other predominantly residential uh, districts, possessing varying degrees of historical and architectural importance. One of the most prominent homes in the district is where we're standing now, the Dibrell House at 1400 Spring Street at the corner of Daisy Base Drive. The home is considered to be in the American Queen Anne style with East Lake detailing. It was constructed in 1892 by a real estate agent named H.A. Bowman as a speculative venture. Eventually, that venture was purchased by Dr. James Dibrell, who was an early president and dean of the medical department of the University of Arkansas, which we now know today as the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Dibrell was born in August 1846 near Van Buren, and his father, James Dibrell Sr., was a prominent pioneer physician in Crawford County who became well known in state medical circles. The Civil War had taken a toll on the Dibrell family finances, so young James began his medical education by, quote, reading medicine. Now, we've heard a lot about in the past men, young men who studied law and read law with a practicing attorney. Well, this was kind of kind of outside the norm. And of course, young James Dibrell had a very good teacher that, of course, his father. He would read and study medicine in the evenings and then worked as an accountant during the day. So I guess he didn't have much problem in either keeping up with his expenses or collecting the bills, unlike a lot of circuit riding uh, doctors during his day. He took elite course of medical lectures at the Medical College of St. Louis in 1867 and 68 and at the University of Pennsylvania, where he received his degree in 1870 as his, as father did in 1839. Upon graduation, young James Dibble moved to Little Rock and immediately began his practice. Like his father, Dibble soon became involved in the political scene of the medical community in order to build a medical infrastructure in the state of Arkansas that became necessary. During his lifetime, he served as president of the city, county, and state medical societies and served as vice president of the American Medical Association. The 1870s had brought an interest in the establishment of a medical school in Arkansas, but several issues had impeded its formation. Disagreements over memberships based on educational background and practice philosophy had led to the formation of multiple local and state medical societies, or for that matter, there was, as I understand it, was even an association of homeopathic physicians. Um, by 1879, those issues had largely been resolved and unity within the medical community of Arkansas had been largely achieved. So with, with that having been accomplished, Dibrell and several other Little Rock physicians organized the medical department of the, University of the Arkansas Industrial University, which we now know as UAMS. Dibrell would become the institution's professor of anatomy and, of course, that was, again, not, at least in the teaching area, was not a very well-practiced or taught specialty among country doctors in Arkansas at that point in time. So that basically added to Dr. Dibble's prominence. But he held this position under several titles until his death in 1904. The construction of this house, now, in 1892, to build this house, it was said to cost $1,000. Now, looked it up in $2017. If you, if you adjust for inflation and the whole thing, the construction cost of this home would have been $25,792. Now, come on, folks. We know nobody was going to even build this home, much less the porch, for $25,000. We'll, that, that, 
you know, taking inflation out of it, that had to have been a very economical builder if indeed it got done when, when it was all said and done. Now, since the 1960s, this house has enjoyed rest restoration of a quality that has rarely been seen outside of museums, and you will definitely notice that the minute you walk through these double doors. An extension re extensive restoration began in 1968 under the ownership of Carl Miller, and the Dimbrell House has become one of the finest, if not the finest, and most extensive and detailed established, sorry, examples of private restoration in Arkansas. Through analysis of old photographs, Carl has reproduced outstanding features such as hand stencil ceilings, sections of ornate trim, woodwork, and paraquat floors. The home also features several seven different porches in six distinct styles, another for reflection of its architectural blend of its Victorian influences. In 1971, a 15-foot steeple was recreated and placed atop the 45-foot tower on the northeast corner of the house, which was very significant given the fact that before Carl purchased the house, it had been altered in front and subdivided for apartments, and the structural integrity was in extreme danger of collapse before that time. The Dimbrels were also able to add their own touches, such as, again, parkwood floors and walnut woodwork. They wanted to add, they also added other touches, such as inlaid wood carpet floors, which were made from maple, walnut, and cherry. Dr. Dibrell was also interested in innovations, and the house became known as the Gadget House for its modern devices such as electric doorbells, burglar alarms, um, and central heating. And you will see that when you come into the house, Carl Miller has continued in the best tradition of Dr. Dibrell's tinkering. Um, there's also a system of speaking tubes this functions to this day as an intercom system. A heating system also warmed every room in the house, which was a huge, an unusual convenience for that time. In fact, Dr. Dibrell was so fascinated by the machine age that was coming, that, that, that was literally going full bore by the turn of the century, that not one original feature in this house was handmade, which is extremely unusual for that time. All of this was mass produced by machines. It, it literally seemed like Dr. Dimple just eschewed um, original handmade items, at least in the structure of the house. Now, by the 1960s, again, like I said just a minute ago, the house had been divided into apartments and had undergone several major structural changes. Since then, the house has been carefully restored, including rebuilding the turret and returning the several, seven porches, one of which we're standing on, to their original appearance. The interior of the house has also been fully restored, also among some of the interior restorations. The downstairs color schemes, I am told, uh, are said to be an exact restoration from Dr. Dibble's day while the upstairs is largely period correct. Becky Witzel was responsible for the authentic, uh, authentic stenciling of the ceiling designs in the home's downstairs room, and I'd like to express my appreciation for Becky's husband being here today. And um, while Carl, and then Carl Miller's mother designed the Four Seasons themes on the bottom level. In the upstairs parlor, two pieces of Dr. Dibrell's legacy are readily apparent. If you go upstairs and look to your left when you go up the stairs, um, sorry, his portrait of the Gilt Edge Hunting Club that is there prominently on the wall that is flanked by his military-style cutlery and canteen set. Now, you folks who, like I do, spent, spent, spent part of a lifetime hunting and roughing it down in lower Arkansas, you, you, you will wonder how they got by with this. His military style cutlery and canteen set that he took out on hunting trips were made of sterling silver. 
Folks, I'm lucky if I had oftentimes just a, some plastic cutlery stuck in my pocket. So this is again far beyond the normal hunting club traditions that are still prevalent in Arkansas to this day. In this same room you will find Dr. Bibrell's portable medical instrument kit, which again does not fit the, the normal stereotype of the instrument bag that the normal surrogate riding doctor uh, would carry that's depicted often in the movies. There's also a commemoration of the medical school's first female graduate, Dr. Annie Schroppett, which was certainly no f small feat around the turn of the century, specifically what we know of the role of women during that time. Now, since Carl Miller purchased the home in 1968, much of the renovation has been, re again, remained true to Dr. Dibrell's reputation as a tinkerer. Now, to, uh, honestly, we would not want to live without modern heat and central air conditioning units today. I mean, we're, we're not as sturdy as our forebears. But even though those have been installed in the house, the return air for the air conditioning still follows the home's original pattern, which is routed through the upstairs transoms. Heat was also plentiful from the start, even before the central heat and air system came in, because it's fed by eight fireplaces, four upstairs, four downstairs, constantly circulating the heat, again by aid of the return air. Going further, the study has remained a central part of the home as when Dr. Dibrell might have seen patients here, and the adjacent sleeping porch was formally screened in. The newest addition to the house, added in 1940, contains what I consider to be the most spectacular part of what is truly a museum, museum quality antique collection. You're going to find, and you don't want to miss it either, a uh, 620th century Nickelodeon machines. We're all familiar with what a Nickelodeon machine is. You know, we kind of think about it for motion pictures. Well, they also were coin-fed music boxes as well. And these, all originals, and they still take nickels. And the price hadn't gone up since 1910. So we've defied inflation in that way. Now, they play the most delightful music as well as retaining features such as the original stained glass. Plus, two of the machines play something different than the piano. One uses the banjo, you're going to love this, and a violin. So you're not going to want to miss this, and I figure most of, most if not all of you are going to. So this very prominent single family home does remain one of the cornerstones of Little Rock's Crawfall Quarter Historic District. And you will see, you're, you're starting to see why, and you will do so as you cross through these double doors a bit. I see Carl is ready to invite everyone in. So I'd like to end by thanking all of you for coming today. Again, this is just an incredible crowd. If, I, if I'm going to guess, we've probably got more than 200 here, but I'll, I'll get an exact count here in just a few minutes. And I'd like to also um, extend a couple of invitations to you first. For our next Sandwiching in History Tour of 2017, come and visit us on Friday, May the 5th, as we go to Jacksonville for a tour of the Arkansas Ordnance Plant Guardhouse and the Jacksonville Museum of Military History at 100 Veterans Circle, beginning as usual at noon. Also, next Saturday, April 15th, take a little short road trip down to Keogh and come to our next Walks Through History Tour of the Keogh Commercial Historic District beginning at the Cobb Cot Jet Complex at Main and Fleming Streets beginning at 11 a.m. Hope to see you at these and many of our other future tours this year, whether here in the Little Rock area or if you just want to take a nice Saturday morning road trip lots of amazing things to see in our amazing Arkansas. And one more reminder, if you're dining out after the tour because these things have built up an appetite, be sure to patronize our local restaurants because as always you're going to love the taste and you're going to build a better Little Rock. Thanks everybody for coming.
the ca uh, press the pause button? Thank you.